Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai hari mai, ko Sophie Sparrow toku inoa, kei ko nga moana, whakauka, aho i mahiana, he kai tohu tohu aho. Hi everyone, thank you all for being here today. My name is Sophie Sparrow. I'm a communications advisor for the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, and I'll be facilitating this webinar today. So today's topic is all about navigating different perceptions of risk and uncertainty. Why do we argue about risk and uncertainty when deciding on the use of marine resources in Aotearoa, New Zealand? Recently published research from our risk and uncertainty projects has exposed the invisible forces that shape people's different perceptions of risk and uncertainty. The projects also offer guidance and tools to help navigate these differences between people and to lead to more inclusive, holistic, ecosystem-based marine management. So today you'll be hearing from some of the team behind this research, uh, but before we begin, just some quick housekeeping. So this webinar is being recorded and we'll have the recording up on our YouTube channel within the next 24 hours if you'd like to share that with others. I uh, will email out a link to you all when this is ready. Now our presenters will speak for around the first half an hour uh, and then we'll have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. So please ask your questions using the Q&A function, which will be down the bottom of your screen. I'll read out the question to our presenters so that everyone can hear them. And please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A at any time during the presentation, and we'll get to them when we are ready for questions. All right, that is all from me. So now I'm going to hand over to Paula Blackett. Thanks, Sophie. Kia ora, everybody. I'm Paula Blackett. Um, I'm just going to uh, quickly acknowledge the rest of the team. Uh, Sean and Joe, who will be um, speaking further on in the webinar, and everybody else. It's quite the team of people, a huge depth of experience and knowledge there, have all contributed to this project. So the way that this uh, webinar is going to be structured is Project 3.1 will be speaking first. That's Sean and myself. Um, around the perceptions of risk and uncertainty. And then we will be handing to Joe to talk about Project 3.2, which is communicating risk and uncertainty. So Project 3.1, perception of risk and uncertainty. We've done a number of uh, case studies and what we have established from those case studies is that people perceive risk and uncertainty in diverse ways and that this is effectively why we're arguing about risk. That we need to unpack and reconcile these differences in order to implement ecosystem-based management and te ao, te ao Māori-based approaches in practice. But how do we actually do this? It's easy to say, but how do we do it? Well, first, we think that we need to make difference more visible and understandable, because often it's hidden and we don't even know it's there. Second, we will provide a set of tools and a framework and some guidance to actually help with this making things more visible and understandable and therefore actionable. So to set the scene, we're going to use the example of a decision-making group. So here's a bunch of folk sitting around the table. They have something to decide that involves risk and uncertainty. So here they all are. Let's just put them into some kind of an example. So here is a proposed wind farm site. This is what these folks need to decide upon. The risk, the area of the proposed wind farm is in orange. The landscape around it, you can see there's a number of communities. There's a marae, a papakainga. There's a marine and coastal reserve. There's a few tourist hotspots. It's pretty popular in terms of fishing as well. There's a number of different perspectives here. Each person is likely to have a different view. So let's go back to put these people. So there's the groups that are present. There's resident associations, there's some tourism groups, there's fishing industries, there's local iwi hapu, there's wider community. There's um, a number of different interests sitting right there. We also have a number of mandated groups. There's Department of Conservation, there's Mana Whenua, there's Regional Council, or potentially the EPA, there's potentially MPI and the Maritime Authority. All of these groups are, have an interest in this and they're all sitting around this table. Here we are. Some of them are happy, some of them are not quite so happy. 
they're all looking at this problem differently. They all have different perceptions of risk, they have different perceptions of uncertainty, and they likely have different desired outcomes. We need to unpack all of that in order to really understand why we're or why this group of people are actually sitting around the table arguing. So let's unpack it. Behind each one of these people are three factors that we believe underpin the perception of risk. There is worldview, which is your implicit knowledge of how the world works, how you think things tick, why you think they tick, and what you th think should happen. There is your disciplinary training, your knowledge of why the world works like that. We all have some kind of discipline, disciplinary training. Also, your positionality, your situated knowledge of place, effectively where you stand. So I'm going to unpack these in a bit more detail. Now, everybody sitting around this table comes at it, comes at the problem with that behind them, but it's hidden. What we see when we're sitting around the table is these facial expressions here. People happy, not so happy about the conversations. Sitting behind that is the unspoken stuff. So let's go first to worldviews. Let's think about the worldviews. So we've identified three different worldviews that are active in Aotearoa. There is the dominant social paradigm, which the underlying kind of ideology here is that we have a bountiful world for resource extraction that economic growth and progress are paramount. There's abundance of resources to exploit it and they be exploited and they are effectively limited, uh, limitless. That limited government interference should be the way things are. Generally supportive of private property rights and business as usual and a high degree of faith of science and technology and a strong view that science is actually value free. In direct contrast to this is the new environmental paradigm which views nature as a limited resource. <clears throat> There's more focus on protect the environment, that protection is more important than resource use. Nature is seen as a delicately balanced system with limited resources, a favor for participatory structures and democracy, uh, that humans should live in harmony with nature, and that science and technology do have their limits and are actually value laden. The third view, which is present in Aotearoa, which is different to um, a lot of the international research, is Te Ao Māori, which is much more a relational environmental approach where prior, prior, uh, priority is given to outcomes of mutual benefit to kin groups and ecosystems. Extracting resources is okay if it builds into generational benefits. It conceptualises ecology um, and society and economics as a, as a bundle rather than separating things out. There's a large um, number of um, concepts that regulate behavior and there are some core principles that are in operation with the resource management. I'm gonna hand over to Sean to talk some more about these. Kia ora uri ahau, nō te tei rāwhiti, nō Ngāti Parau, e kai mahi mō Manaki Whenua, Nanki Research, kō Sean awa te So within the context of a te triti informed natural resource management, legal and policy context, decades of legal precedent and case law, Mātanga Māori is increasingly informing approaches towards natural resource management in Aotearoa. But what is Mātanga Māori, you might ask? You know, for the listener seven and the Richard Dawkins of the world, it's nothing to be scared of, but ought to be embraced. Mātananga Māori is not biocultural knowledge, nor is it traditional ecological knowledge. Mātananga Māori is intertwined with people, their history, culture, and ecosystems. It's dynamic. It's dynamic and changes as ecological pressures influence its development. So mātaranga includes the belief systems, the worldviews, the values, biophysical science, astronomical science, and knowledge in both a traditional and contemporary sense. So similar to Western knowledge, in terms of epistemology, mātaranga Māori has both qualitative and quantitative aspects. Important to remember that. So mātaranga Māori can be defined as knowledge, comprehension, or understanding of everything visible and invisible in the, in the universe. So whilst the risk and uncertainty in environmental management is commonly considered 
in the context of how to reduce the potential impact of an activity. Māori instead have a different worldview perspective, thinking of how an activity can enhance the mana or the intrinsic value of a natural resource in the first instance, rather than being limited to reducing adverse risk. So worldviews, they crucially affect how rights are perceived and what risk may be taken with the, with the balance of those rights. So dominant worldviews have the most influence, uh, the, the dominant social paradigm that Paul referred to, that has the most influence on how rights are distributed. So private property is a really important concept within the economic growth model. Libertarians are committed to the rights of private property, but oftentimes they fail to acknowledge the limitations of those rights and the impacts of those rights on others, such as the externalities, the uh, external things that are caused by production, such as polluted waterways, slash, and increasing carbon emissions. And at the same time, those private property rights within that worldview often don't extend to marginalized or vulnerable groups in society. Hence the inherent hypocrisy in some of our current political ideology. So improving the rights of vulnerable groups and marginalized groups like Māori means acknowledging that worldviews do have a role in natural resource management decision-making processes. Next slide. So from this research, we tentatively surmise that the way that we have traditionally come to know or not know risk with respect to the environment is compounding the difficulties of stepping towards a to three to inform natural resource management process. So learning how to work in partnership within a to three to context is fundamentally shaping relations and practices. Acknowledging that we are different from any other country in our particularities is important. Different kinds of things matter here, in part because multiple worldviews are beginning to be recognized and situated in place. This helps us collectively reimagine decision-making and pose questions such as, hmm, what if we didn't have an economy that wasn't driven by greed and maximizing profit, but instead the investment was driven by achieving a balance between societal needs and the well-being of the tail and the environment? Or another question that we could pose is, what if enhancing the mana or the intrinsic value of the tail or the natural environment informed our priorities? So the dichotomy of economy versus the environment needs to be shaken up. Instead of being in opposition, they're all part of complex systems. The wider set of cultural influences at work in Aotearoa means that as well as the staunchly individualistic and profit privileging dominant social paradigm, there's other models of the world out there that expose us to the need to develop collective capacities, working together collectively. We did it for a minute back in 2020. And also other models that account for intergenerational transfer of risk. So acknowledging and working with multiple worldviews offers us a chance to shift from a focus solely on the individual to a more nuanced, complex approach. The next slide. So how can we work with multiple worldviews to shift towards a vision, a collective vision for Tataya? Now, the context specificity of shared values means that one size fits all type of approach, yeah, it's going to be problematic. Uh, and so, if you look at an example like the the Tai Tsumi Tai Pari Haraki Marine Spatial Plan Sea Change and Integrated ha Kaipara Harbour Management Group, or well, Kaipara Remediation Group, as examples, the examples of Tangata Whenua working in partnership with dairy farmers, fishers, and miners, local and central government, all working towards a collective vision of restoring the health and modi of the Kaipara Harbour. It's about farmers being informed by a long-term vision of collective well-being and a setting aside whenua that could, that could potentially be used for production in order to do planting on them, planting of trees, to improve the water quality and the modi of the Kaipara Harbour so that everyone can benefit, benefit from Tataio. So translating... The implications and other issues like translating those um, high level concepts like Modi into policy can be quite problematic. And I think that gets a lot of politicians in a bit of a, in a tangle, a bit of a bind. But partnership approaches for Tutiri to inform natural resource management approaches need to be able to respond and adapt through a negotiated space or a process to ensure that 
indigenous values are adequately considered in planning documents. If we move away from some of those uh, tricky concepts to understand and down into the practical, I think we can find some places where we can reconcile those differences. Then another a challenge that we have in terms of implementing partnership approaches is that oftentimes there's a lack of resourcing of the kaitiaki to be better able to participate in those planning processes. So participation by kaitiaki in those planning processes need to be adequately resourced. So despite these challenges, I think it's it was becoming increasingly accepted that multiple worldviews play a role in natural resource management in Aotearoa. So understanding worldviews is fundamental for the successful implementation of Tiriti informed partnership approaches within Aotearoa, particularly within institutional arrangements that encourage collective decision-making and power sharing. The context specificity of the shared values means that implementation of a universalistic set of policies rules and methods it will be troublesome, it's going to be problematic. So instead of the application of you know, market-based approaches, you need to embrace both specificity alongside qualitative, the cordial, the narrative is therefore really useful. Then on another point, you know, undoing the decades of te Tiriti jurisprudence, natural resource management policy, legal precedents and case law is going to take time, it's going to take resources. From a libertarian approach, this amount of uncertainty and inefficiency will potentially impinge on private property rights properly functioning in markets in order to generate wealth, right? So in, in theory, this approach of undoing to CT jurisprudence, creating this uncertainty ought not to be supported. So there's got to be some other type of nefarious political ideology at play that's motivating political actors rather than their primary form of ideology that provides them with cover. So the role of yourselves as civil servants, civil society and researchers, and the acknowledgement of and support for Māori to participate as to three T partners in natural resource management in Aotearoa is going to be especially critical for the next three years, but... I applaud your guys' leadership in this place, in this space. So kia ora koutou. Kia ora, Sean. So that's a window into worldviews. But there's other things in this. There's also our disciplinary training. We're all effectively trained in something, in some ways, and whether or not we are able to recognise the unwritten rules that sit within these disciplines when we're involved in these discussions, it raises an interesting question. Um, so there are, every discipline thinks about risk in a different way, perceives risk in a different way, thinks that risk can be understood, explored and explained in a different way. And those are not usually conversations we have. Quite often we will assume that everybody else thinks about risk in the same way that we were trained to think about risk. A lack of exposing that can lead to conflict. So just some differences here that are pretty obvious. Economics is very much a decisional phenomenon. Decisions are made using calculations. Risks might be around risks to business, risks to wealth. Um, psychology, behavioral and psychology, so, uh, cognitive ways of exploring things. Um, very much around based around individuals and risk is again constructed in a particular way. Sociology tends to view risk as a societal phenomenon. It becomes to understand it through social frameworks um, and has again another particular view on it. Science and modeling um, views risk as objective and then you can calculate it. There's a series of principles that sit behind that. There's different ways, even the different science disciplines disagree. There's there's different ways of framing up risk in ecology versus hazards. Um, everybody comes to it in a different way. And the main point here is that if this is unexplored and unacknowledged and we don't ask each other how we are perceiving and understanding risk based on how we are trained and how we are thinking, then we are more likely to come into conflict over different potential outcomes within a decision-making space. So let's just look at this on our, on our landscape. So here are all the different disciplines 
It's a variety of colours here. They have overlapping interests, overlapping mandates, uh, overlapping uh, perceptions of risk. Um, it's quite it's quite the mess, really. <laughs> Everybody's coming at it with a slightly different lens, slightly different focus, a slightly different way of how they believe risk can be under perceived, understood, and explained. Really important to always to unpick this. The other critical factor is positionality. So essentially, this is kind of where you stand, your position relative to the situation, how you feel about an issue, your aspirations, your desired outcomes, how you are affected. This tends to be a little bit more personal. Um, and it is probably quite difficult to actually unpick in any given circumstance, but it's always present and needs light shone on it. Right, so that's the decision makers taken care of. We can think through those, sorry, the folks around the table, that's how they're thinking. The decision makers have also got their own positions, their own worldviews, their own positionalities, their own disciplinary trainings to which they are bringing to the discussion as well. There is also legislation. There is policies and practice, which also often comes from a particular um, position. Uh, worldviews that Sean alluded to before, dominant social paradigm tends to be the one that dominates in a lot of the, the legislation and often the policies and practices. There's definitely other worldviews in there. There's a real mix of disciplinary training, so this all comes to bear as well, making for a particularly complicated situation and a heck of a lot of arguments about perceptions of risk and uncertainty. So here we go. This is This is what we see. All the stuff that we've talked about is going on in the background. It is the reason why people are saying the things that they say. They're acting the way that they're acting. They're arguing against the things that they are. But what we see is the happy face, the smiley face, the shocked face, the sadness. We don't necessarily go and unpick what's behind it, which effectively means that we have massive arguments regarding risk. So... How do we make this difference? How do we approach this situation in a way that allows us to navigate the difference rather than just arguing it out in a decision-making process with a limited understanding of the position of others? So what we have done here is we have come up with two tools. Now, these tools are available in the, um, in the guidance which we put together. So our first step is to make the different make difference more visible. How do we do that? We have a tool for that, which is around unpacking perceptions of risk and uncertainty. The second tool we have is around working with difference and stimulating new practices. So working with the different perceptions of risk. So I'm going to give you a really quick look at these if you want more detail. There's much more in the guidance document. Effectively, the first diagnostic tool is, is peep, to allow people to unpack the different perceptions of risk and uncertainty that sit around the table. Your own plus that of others. And this provides a series of questions that help understand the different, the different worldviews that are there, the positionalities and the disciplines so that you can then work to address them. Basically, making difference more visible. The next tool that we have created is around actually working with these different perceptions of risk. So now that we understand them, how do those affect the way that we think and how do we unpick them in a way that is helpful to allow us to navigate these disagreements? Again, I'm not going to go into this in a huge amount of detail, but we do pose several key questions. We ask people to think about how treaty partnerships are enacted, to think about what they consider to be evidence because how people consider evidence is important to what they think should be incorporated in decision-making process. To think about the right tools for the job. Now, Joe's going to elaborate a lot more on this. To think about how the process we're actually running constrains the content that we're discussing. So are we narrowing down our frame of discussion and is that helpful or is that not helpful? and then to consider what balance of rights are supported. There's often a tension between collective rights and property rights, and this needs attention in a decision-making process. Again, please go and take a look at it in much more detail in the guidance. 
we don't have the time to dig into this. So the idea behind this is really that we are trying to stimulate new practices that allow us to navigate the different perception of risk and effectively reduce some of the conflict that's built up by perceptions of risk and work our way through to potentially better outcomes. So from our work, we have some key outputs and outcomes. Um, we have a cartoon which asks the question, what if we had a narrow view of risk and evidence? What sort of world would that lead us to? And do we want that world? We have a variety of academic publications. Um, we have a framework and guidance document, which is available on the Sustainable Seas website, which are coupled with a series of quick fact sheets. So that is 3.1. I'm now going to hand over to Joe, who is going to um, talk about the work in 3.2. So all yours, Joe. In the Koto Katoa, Ko Joanne Ellis. Uh, thank you, Paula and Sean. Um, so I'm going to focus, as Paula has indicated, on some of the tools and approaches that may be available to us to support risk assessment in an ecosystem-based management perspective. So if we're looking at the uh, slide here, we can see on the left a very simple risk assessment that is focusing on one activity. Um, so that's the risk from what stressor, and it's influencing, in this case, um, one species, risk to what value. And we've just had really clear um, presentation on the importance of considering different values, worldviews, and positionalities. Um, however, we all know that as decision makers and environmental managers are transitioning towards more holistic ecosystem-based management, we're actually on the right-hand side of this diagram. So we're, we have, uh, we're managing multiple cumulative effects. You know, now we've got, say, an oil and gas platform, fisheries, emerging sectors such as offshore wind farms, climate change. And obviously, um, we have those interactions also on the social, cultural, and eco ecological values. So they're all interacting, um, and there's feedbacks, direct and indirect effects. So the risk assessments, we need to be moving from those uh, simple evaluations of direct impacts of a single stressor on a species or habitat over towards considering cumulative effects and multiple values. And this also triggers thoughts around um, when there might be timely points for management actions or interventions. Next. So as part of the Sustainable Seas Challenge, we reached out from an Aotearoa New Zealand perspective to look at the types of methods and tools, risk assessment tools, that are currently being used in New Zealand. And many of you on this webinar helped us with identifying what are the current existing methods that are applied. Um, and one of the things that became very clear was that um, not all of the methods and frameworks that are available um, are fit for purpose in an Aotearoa New Zealand perspective. And that's because they may not be able to manage for cumulative effects. And it's also because they may not be responsive to different priorities, positionalities, and values. Um, so we identified 12 criteria that we believe are going to be quite important for risk assessments to support decision-making in a more holistic perspective. And that includes whether or not the risk assessment can incorporate various um, values. Can it consider multiple knowledge types? Can the risk assessment, for example, consider uh, feedbacks, indirect effects, and interactive effects? Can it produce spatial or temporal place-based knowledge and outputs? And can it consider things like recovery, threshold responses, and obviously, important, un importantly, uncertainty? Because if estimates of uncertainty around a risk um, perspective can also help influence that decision-making um, process. Next. So um, a lot of this information was brought together into a guidance document. Um, I'm not expecting you to be able to um, read all this information, but what you'll see is there's a number of approaches um, in the second column from the right. And these are the existing uh, risk assessment approaches that tend to be used um, in Aotearoa New Zealand. They range from simple likelihood consequence models that can be used um, if you have a low complexity 
through to your things like um, systems dynamic modeling, agent-based modeling, Bayesian networks. We have developed an ecological principles-based approach to managing for risk. And I'm going to cover this off in a bit more detail because this is a, a new way of thinking about risk. Um, through to at the very bottom of those approaches, you have your Atlantis um, models, which represent full end-to-end -end models. So there's um, a, a range of steps that you can step through in terms of the complexity of your system, um, the types of outcomes that you have, um, what are you wanting, what types of knowledge would you like to be able to include. Um, obviously, some some systems will not be able to include multiple knowledge types and therefore they may not be fit for purpose. The time and cost to implement um, is things like the ease of implementation, expertise required, and so on. So next, so with respect to choosing the right tool, um, if, for example, you're wanting to ensure that you're mindful of multiple worldviews and um, cumulative effects, then some of these tools are automatically going to fall away. Next. Um, because they won't be able to uh, account for this. Next. Um, similarly, if you're interested in all types of evidence, some of these tools may be more fit for purpose. Next. Uh, and similarly, with respect to low information costs. And next. Uh, ease of understanding and communicating those outputs. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. So I'm just going to spend, um, before I finish up on the sort of methods and tools available, I just wanted to highlight some thinking that's been developed within the challenge by the cumulative effects team. So this is a research that was led by Jasmine Lowe and the cumulative effects program, uh, Simon Thrush and Conrad Pilditch, around thinking about not just the stressor footprint, but also the ecological response footprint. So if we have an activity, um, that will have a stressor footprint, which is shown in this diagram in the yellow color. But that stressor footprint can be larger because, for example, you may have um, suspended sediments from dredging that are dispersing into the environment. And traditionally, risk assessments will think about just that stressor footprint from an ecological perspective. Um, but what we'd like to highlight is that this needs to be combined with the ecology, so with that ecological response to the stressor. And essentially, these things can be disconnected because the ecological response footprint can be greater at the same scale or patchy or smaller than that stressor response. And this is because we have ecological connectivity, um, an area that's impacted by a stressor might be providing uh, recruits for another area, it might be a source population for a sink area, and we have differing sensitivities of the organisms in that environment to those stressors. Next. So we've combined this into some thinking around the ecological response related to the spatial extent and the depth persistence. So it's not just the uh, stressor dispersal characteristics, but it's also thinking about how they uh, interact with the ecology and questions around that ecological connectivity. Next. And if we take this one step further, we can think about this in terms of assisting with um, management interventions and also the likelihood of risk of um, an alternative undesirable state. So if we're in the bottom left-hand side of this diagram, we've got a small spatial extent of the ecological response footprint and depth of that footprint. It may be fine to simply monitor for further change um, and not have any types of management interventions. But if we have a large spatial scale and depth of that ecological footprint, we're going to be over in the top right hand side of this diagram where the risk of an ecological shift is very high. And then we may need some type of um, active intervention. Next slide. So we've developed um, some principles to, to, to incorporate this ecological complexity. Um, and to put these into principles-based risk assessment tools where we have developed risk principles that link our understanding 
of the ecological um, way that the system responds to stress to different ecological outcomes. So in the framework, there's risks, ecological principles um, that relate to the resilience of that system and how long it will take to recover. These include things such as um, principle E1 that relates to the number of large and slow um, growing structure forming species that are present in the system. E2 is whether or not there are feedback loops and processes that support resilience to stress through to your E6, which is the size of your ecosystem. And then we have the stressor principles. S1 is the number of stresses. Obviously, the more stresses there are in the system, the more the likelihood of negative outcomes through to your um, stressor six principle that relates to the uh, footprint. And when you combine these two, it informs that the rate of likely rate of degradation and recovery. Next slide. So we can um, potentially think about having actions that are mismatched or matched with the scales of this degradation and recovery. If we think about two hypothetical estuaries, the blue estuary here is one that was already in this first scenario. Um, if we choose to reduce the inputs, the stressor inputs um, into that estuary and let the estuary recovery, the first scenario, we're going to have improvement through time once the stresses are reduced because the ecosystem started at a good state, a good function before the action was taken. However, if we look at our second scenario in purple, um, despite stress of reduction, we're not seeing that recovery because the degradation um, was so severe before the action was taken that we've got these legacies in the system. And in this case, um, we are going to need assisted recovery to restore that good health. And so the final, um, next, the final slide simply summarizes all of this. Um, so we need to limit stress and sometimes we need to actively restore. So key points as we cycle through this diagram, if we do nothing in response to increasing stressor regimes, ecological degradation occurs. If interventions to reduce stresses occur before major ecological damage and feedbacks, then simply removing those stresses um, can, can be enough to recover the ecosystem's functionality. But once we've got a legacy effects, we're going to need some sort of active um, intervention to promote that recovery. So fi next final slide, um, we'd just like to acknowledge that people perceive risk and uncertainty in diverse ways. And as um, Paula and Sean have highlighted, this generates conflict over these desired outcomes. Um, we need to be able to unpack, understand and navigate those differences in order to enact EBM and Te Ao Māori approaches and practice. Um, we've developed some guidance documents on navigating risk and uncertainty that are available um, and that also consider some of the components related to maintaining ecological health and complexity. Uh, tēnā koto katoa. Uh, thank you very much. Nā mihi. Oh. Thank you, Paula, Sean, and Joe for your karero. Uh, we now have time for questions, so please pop these through in the Q&A. Uh, we've got a few come through already, but I will just mention that the guidance document is available up on our website. I have put a link in the chat, but I'll also send out a link to your emails uh, along with the recording for this webinar. Alrighty, so our first question is that risk is not the same as uncertainty. So do you make a distinction? And if so, how? Well, I have a go at that first. Um, we found that when dealing with people, um, that risk and uncertainty are actually very, very deeply entangled and that most people struggle to separate them out. Um, our technical training create, allows us to separate them out and to have different components, but when making a decision, the average person simply doesn't. So we do acknowledge that there is a difference, um, but we um, found that they were somewhat disciplinary based and didn't really exist with the average person involved in the decision making process. And I'm, I'm going to hand to Joe, who will also be able to add to that. Um, kia ora. 
Yes, and it's a wonderful question. Um, from a disciplinary perspective, um, there's certainly methods and tools that we have available. And yes, the estimate of risk um, will be different than the estimate of uncertainty. One of the things that we've found is that those different types of information can be used to support different decisions depending on the context. So from a conservation and restoration perspective, including measures of uncertainty can be really helpful for where is the best area to restore a system and to make sure that you're including, for example, that uncertainty information. Um, one case study we did with Afimai Afiatu, um, they used a Bayesian network where they were including Mataranga Māori and risk um, from based on the Bayesian network using sort of species information to inform where the best areas may be for restoring their shellfish. And they certainly considered uncertainty in that decision-making process. So it's a great question. And there's lots of different um, sources of information that you can use for supporting a decision. Brother, thank you. Uh, another question that's come through. Uh, in many ways, the issue is that different people and groups are optimizing different objectives, isn't it? Yep, <laughs> to some degree. Um, but I think we framed it slightly differently in that the uh, the objectives that they're trying to optimise are based in the way that they believe the world should work, which ties back to both their worldview and their positionality. So often what we see is, yes, different people trying to optimise different outcomes and trying to achieve their own desired objectives, but they're doing that for a reason. And that's what we've attempted to do is to, to unpack that because that behaviour that we see on the surface um, has a whole lot of explainers that we do need to unpack in order to, to come to some sort of, or to come closer to some sort of collective agreement. So yeah, it is different. It is to some extent, but there's a lot more to it and we've tried to dig underneath the surface to get at that. Hence our splitting into worldviews, discipline and positionality to try and help unpack it. Yeah, I can add on to that. And then in contrast, it's it's not so much an optimization approach that Hapu and Iwi are interested in, but more around how do you actually get a balance between our current activities and ensuring that the, the environment is, or well, the taia was looked after for future generations. So it's just prioritizing in different ways the, the types of activities that mean the most for us. Thank you. Uh, our next question, should those most directly affected have more say? For example, in an area directly affected by sea level rise, homeowners may call for protection measures to save their homes, while those who don't live there may value the natural environment and amenities and be opposed to such protection measures. How do we balance such aspects? Thanks for that question, Chris. <laughs> um, I think that's the ongoing question, and that starts to get into a different area, which is around um, power and who has the power to affect different outcomes. I mean, yes, the homeowners in the um, sea level rise situation are always the ones that are crying the loudest for particular courses of action, and they have... Um, clear objectives to protect their homes at the cost of all other um, all other values. Um, they usually sit within that sort of dominant social paradigm space, the desire to protect coastal property, um, the belief that um, economics is the primary thing that we should be attending to. Um, and then you have the others who are usually a little bit quieter in the background who may or usually value the natural environment, the beach, the amenity that is um, that is associated with that. And a balancing out of those actions, I think, requires careful attention to power. Who is there? Um, what are they saying? Why are they saying it? And actually using more of a, a long-term view and actually really digging into it and discussing what is actually at stake from taking those various courses of action and kind of working through that um, practice of acknowledging each other's position, each other's power, and just thinking about it in the, in the longer term um, 
yeah, I mean that's a that's a really big issue in um in coastal adaptation remains. So I think it still goes back to that. Uh, going back to the tools of you know, optimization or ensuring that you've got um, an efficient type of outcome utilizing cost benefit analysis. So it's still driven from that frame. If we reframe it and actually prioritize the, the ones who are feeling it the most in terms of the impacts from climate change and the ones who are less able to adapt for, so from an equity and moral position, the way that you uh, prioritize your efforts in terms of adaptation will shift, will change from those who are more well off to those who are less well off. And then in the same issue, in the same context, acknowledging the the rights and interests of Iwi and Hapa to participate in those decision making processes as well as is equally important. Thank you. Uh, in the decision-making matrix and the perceived perceptions that were offered on how different levels of authority had perceived perceptions, do you factor in Māori staff who work for Crown agencies specifically to address treaty obligations uh, and with skills and understandings in order to fulfil, fulfil those obligations? So do you take those into account? Yeah, I guess uh, Paul is asking me to answer that one. <laughs> I'm struggling to figure out what the decision-making matrix is. Was that something that we presented? I think um, I think the role, uh, my response is probably that role of civil servants, including Māori civil servants, is going to be really important to help shape up the framing for how you approach some of these natural resource management issues and problems uh, at the moment or in the past it often comes from um, a scientific position or the position from an efficiency perspective or a perspective of reducing risk and mitigating um, any potentially uh, adverse effects that might occur to a group or or certain individuals. So I think reframing the conversation around Māori perspectives within developing policy is really essential. So for example, if you look at um, measuring and assessing the, the impacts to the natural environment, you could pretty much do a pressure state impact type of approach and that's business as usual. But reframing it from te ao Māori perspectives actually means that you take a different lens to the issue and include other different types of narratives and qualitative evidence that is just as equally important to help making to help make a more richer and holistic assessment of the of the issue that you're dealing with so i think importantly bringing that lens to the development of policy in terms of a te ao maori lens is really a critical and essential that's a role of Māori civil servants to provide that, along with allies within those ministries to do that. And at the same time, acknowledge that you probably have to bring in um, expertise external to the agency to help create and develop those narratives. And if I could just add um, a great question around the need to have, you know, more representation in terms of the on the decision making committees, but obviously. There's also um, an increasing um, growth in terms of what is considered as evidence, for example, in environment court. And we are seeing a real shift to multiple types of evidence that's used in a decision-making context. Um, and so that's when we reviewed some of the risk assessment methods in Aotearoa, New Zealand. A lot of them weren't fit for purpose um, because, for example, they wouldn't consider alternate non-science or non-quantitative information. So we needed to be able to look for what can support those alternative working partnerships um, as one pathway or other multiple forms of evidence that are considered in that decision-making process is really important. All right, thank you, Sean and Joe. Uh, I'm curious to hear how the concept of risk is perceived and expressed in indigenous worldviews and in traditional management systems. 
and whether you know of any examples where Indigenous knowledge has directly informed risk assessment? Yeah, good question. I think we answered it in the presentation, and it was primarily around the the perceptions of risk comes from certain disciplines, you know, from legal profession, from economics, and so on, and science. And it's really around the understanding how you exploit and utilize resources up to a point before it tips over. And then, then you, you look at kind of mitigating the risk or minimizing the, the risk of those activities. So it's driven by a certain uh, paradigm, you know, that dominant social paradigm of profit maximization. So as a result, the, if you reframe it from an Indigenous perspective, it's about trying to rebalance and ensure that you're working with te taia, with the natural environment, rather than uh, exploiting it to a point where it's going to tip over. So in that way, you know, those notions of minimizing the risk aren't so prevalent, but more important is around understanding the notions of how do you enhance the, the well-being of the environment, particularly if you see that you are inherently connected to that environment. So the framing of people's connections to place uh, are different. It's not seeing that the environment is something to to take and extract individual benefit, but more that you're part of a community that includes people and those ecosystems, and you're trying to work in harmony and balance. So it's a different framing of how you approach the, the issue of natural resource management. We wrote a paper on it. I don't know if, uh, if you've got the link to that, Sophie. I'm sure I can dig it up and put it in the oh, yeah. email, which will see that. All right. Uh, our next asker, thank you for the great presentations. Could you possibly elaborate a little more on how the shift from individual to collective capacities is happening in a concrete example? Does this include in some ways a shift to more environmental justice based views rather than a conservationist view? Or is that too simplistically put? Thank you. Well, I just quickly yeah, refer to the, the Kaipara Remediation Group, great example of where you've got uh, people representing various industries, really important industries, plus uh, Hapu and Iwi and local and central government working in partnership to achieve uh, not just well-being for themselves, but the well-being for the environment. So you yeah, check out the, the work that the Kaipara Remediation Group has been, been doing, and you've got some more kind of papers written about what they've been up to. Now, Paula, Joanne might have some other examples. There's some, there's some work that we did in a previous Sustainable Seas um, project uh, looking at participatory processes and the the drive towards collectivism was more was a lot associated with the fact that people realized that they didn't like the direction of travel and they couldn't do anything about it on their own and they needed to actually form alliances to get change and that that created a shift towards more sort of collective, um, practices and associating with others to to change the direction of travel that nobody really liked. Um, we have a couple of papers around that which sit in the um, participatory processes component of the Sustainable Seas website. So there's more information there, but there's quite a few examples up and down the country. There's often the Coast Care has, is a really good example of how that sort of thing happens. There's also Te Korowai, there's the um, Fiordland Guardians, there's a whole lot of them. Um, and some of our earlier papers will give a lot more a lot more detail and insight on that. So, Jo, have you got anything to, to add? No, nothing further. Right, thanks all. Uh, although risk and uncertainty are entangled, is there any insights observed from your research where decision makers might want these two to be disentangled and communicated differently? Um, let me think about that one for a minute. Uh, I think as decision makers, yes, we do typically want to see these disentangled um, but I think our audience doesn't always separate them 
And I think that's something that we actually need to be quite mindful of. If we're attempting to communicate something, then we need to communicate it in a way that connects with the people that we wish to have these conversations with. And that might mean that we have to be creative about how we communicate the concepts of risk and uncertainty um, and how we work with the knowledge that's that's out there and the entanglement that is out there um, rather than attempt as and maybe we start from there and then we can start to separate those a little bit out, out a little bit more as people start to learn more about how the technical folks think. So I think a starting point for me when I'm working with a community is always how do they understand it? How is things mixed up for them? Okay, now how do I start to bring slightly different ways of thinking about risk and uncertainty into this conversation to um, so that everybody's understanding is, is broadened? Yeah. Anyone so else one, want to have a go? Yeah, so one, one thing that um, I found is it's very helpful to have um, a period where you're familiarizing yourself um, if you're producing estimates of risk and uncertainty that people have a clear understanding of what though that information means um, so for example I'll just use this as a, an example to illustrate so uh, in terms of citations there was some work that was done within the challenge where we were looking at um, the information we know about where we believe they're occurring through some species distribution models. And we were able to then overlay that with activities to have um, areas that would represent conservation priorities from a management perspective, because you may have overlap of hotspots of cetaceans with activities. Now, if you present that information, a next step that you could also present um, was to then overlay your certainty or your uncertainty in terms of those hot spots for conservation priorities. And so then we did the same thing in terms of saying, OK, well, this is how certain or uncertain we are on those hot spots um, for management um, perspectives. And by building through that information um, that was really, really helpful in terms of people arriving at decisions around what the priority areas for conservation would be. So you can separate them out, but often you want to step through the information and, and what it means, and then what it means for different people as well. Right, thank you all. Uh, so we are running out of time. We're almost at 12. Uh, do any of our presenters have any final comments before we wrap up? All happy? Lovely. Uh, so that brings our webinar to a conclusion for today. So a big thank you to our presenters for sharing their research highlights uh, and for answering those questions. And of course, a thank you to our audience for asking those questions. It was a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, we'll have an email in your inbox soon with links to the research and to this recording and some further information. Uh, but in the meantime, please do visit our website, Sustainable Seas, uh, if you'd like to read a bit more about this research and our wider work. Uh, thank you all for coming along. Ka kite anō.